What's up everybody, welcome back, my name is Brandon Clements and in this tutorial we're going to take a look at doing CG photoreal renderings inside of Moto 901 and how to actually set those up, how to light them and actually take them into a compositing software afterwards and improve the look and feel of those renders. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump in and see how we can do this. So if we take a look down here in the 3D view, uh, I, I've went ahead and set up two area lights and um, you can see how they're actually casting into the scene in the preview window. But when I go ahead and create any scene, I think of what's the most appropriate way to light this scene or what's the most practical way of lighting this scene. And I think about like maybe it's uh, on a movie set or on like a film set or you know how we would light for photography. I think of it in the most practical way possible. So I'll go ahead and walk through some of the ways that I thought about lighting this scene. Uh, this large area light here, you can see some of the settings that I've used. It's pretty big. Um, it's you know visible to camera ref uh, reflection and refraction rays, just like every light is, and uh, has an, inter an inverse distance squared falloff type, which means that it actually decays as the light is projected into the scene, just like a real world light. And uh, the radiance is uh, set to three, so it's not that bright, but since the area is so large, it's actually, um, you know, a kind of a balancing act between intensity and the actual size of the light. So if you have a small light, you'll probably need a larger intensity to actually throw it into the scene. And if you have a large light, you'll need smaller intensity to actually throw it into the scene because it's just, uh, it's contributing overall uh, a lot more to that um, particular scene that you're in. So we can go ahead and look at the light material and I kind of treated this as like a large window light. So if you click on the color and then you click on the Kelvin scale, you can choose what light color you would actually like to use. And this helps me a lot uh, as in thinking like on set, what type of light, what type of temperature that light's going to be set at. Um, you know, is it a, is it a disc? Is it a, um, a large rectangle light? Um, and then we go ahead and choose the color. So try to think of it as lighting practically. And then this light over here is pretty much the overall direction of the shadows. You can see um, if we go ahead and select its light material and the color, it actually it falls into this sun at noon um, temperature. So it's more warm and it's smaller, so it's creating more sharp shadows in that the large light is just kind of an overall diffuse type light. It's it's creating these very soft shadows. So that's one thing to, no to note when you're actually choosing area lights is definitely think about the size of those lights because it will affect your scene dramatically depending on how large or how small it will be. And then another thing that I like inside of Moto um, is the way you can set up environments and uh, I'll leave a link in the description to the artist who uh, supplied these HDRs. They're um, really awesome. He's went ahead and tone mapped everything and the uh, intensity of these maps are so bright uh, that it gives you um, great caustics. It gives you amazing burnt in reflections, which kind of gives that photorealism look. So I use HDRs as more or less as a fill uh, because if I have uh, two large sources or I have two sources, it will kind of clean up that GI and it won't be as noticeable. So I'll get kind of faster render times and uh, overall it will just help contribute that complex lighting that I miss from just having regular old CG lights into the scene. So let's go ahead and take a look at the light environment. Uh, it's just set to, uh, you know, 0.5, uh, half of the default and is visible to uh, direct or, I'm sorry, visible to indirect rays. It is not visible to the camera. So this is accu actually just setting the tone and the color into the scene. And if we click on the texture inside of the light environment, you can see that we've set the minimum spot to 120. And what that does is it blurs the image itself. So if we blur this image, it actually just gives us a nice overall color definition to the scene. And we don't have to worry about those neighboring pixels going from a very bright pixel to a dark pixel. Um, that's going to cause a lot of noise in our GI calculation. So it's pretty cool that you can go ahead and do that inside of Moto. And you can see in the reflection um, slot, it's the same image, but the minimum spot is by default at one. So you get very sharp reflections and then you get a blurry overall lighting calculation. And then the reflection environment has the exact same um, settings except for it's visible only to the reflection and refraction. So you can actually have your reflections more visible 
or actually the, the thing I should say is that you can set the intensity higher than the actual light so you could have kind of more of a backlit look if you wanted to, um, which helps in a lot of cases if you strategically um, set up your HDRs for just reflections. So that's a pretty cool trick. Um, and then overall, we'll take a look at the render settings. I went ahead and of course with every um, with every scene inside of Moto, you're, you're set up with a final color output by default. And I went ahead and duplicated these and I've changed all of these so that um, in my compositing package, I have everything split up and I can add them together and multiply them together to create the final image and have much more control. Now the cool thing in 901 is that you can uh, set the exposure control to photographic and then if you go into your camera that you're rendering from, you can go ahead into the effects, you can enable depth of field, um, but I already have a depth map that I'll show you how to set up, and then you can set the f-stop. So the f-stop and the um, the film ISO speed, if you're familiar with uh, um, photography, you can go ahead and set it up like a real world camera, which helps so much when you're um, creating these renders because um, I'll go ahead and unpause preview. And you can see that I can pr bring up the intensity of all the lights if I set it to like, you know, 1600. Um, you get a completely different look. So you don't have to go in and just create um, or I'm sorry, you don't have to go in and adjust every single setting of your light. You can bring them up all at once or take them down all at once, which, which helps a lot. So I'll set it back to 600. Um, and of course you can put any kind of custom numeric number that you want inside of there. And I never clamp the colors on these render outputs because I don't want clamped values inside of my compositing package. You can see that I, I, I have a vignette that I've actually added into the final color output and I could do this in post, but um, I kind of like to start more photo reel. I, I try to get as close as I can to photo reel inside of Moto or inside of any um, animation application that I'm using and I'm rendering from. And then inside of my compositing package, I'll get it like 20 to 30 percent better or closer to, to what I feel is more photo reel. So we'll take a look at some of the render settings that I'm using uh, inside of Global Illumination. I am um, using Monte Carlo, so uh, my indirect illumination up here, all these settings are controlled uh, by Monte Carlo, and then everything down here is the irradiance cache only in the second bounce. And I've made sure that in each of these render outputs, um, if you go ahead and we open the render window, we can take a look at the latest one once it loads up. And I went through each of my render outputs and checked for noise. So if I go into my reflection, um, you can see that it's very, very clean here. And if I go to my transparent, you can see it's also clean. Um, I, I try to balance between having an, a nice noiseless image and getting uh, an optimal render time. And this is at 1920 by 1080. Um, on my machine right now, it took 30 minutes, um, which for still isn't bad, uh, you know. It's just kind of a balancing act. How long do you want to wait? How long can your client wait? And um, overall, I, I really like how clean this image is. So um, 30 minutes for me wasn't too bad. So you're probably thinking about how can we clean up some of those, um, some of the noise in, in the scene. And it's pretty much floating between um, anti-aliasing settings and sampling settings and then re all your reflection sampling settings on your materials, on your shaders. So a cool feature inside of Moto is that you can specifically target um, sh uh, materials or shaders that are giving you trouble um, when you're trying to clean up noise. So if I look at uh, this metal lip on the iPhone, I have my reflection rays at 8K, which is pretty high. And um, you can go ahead and add in these actual shaders and adjust the shading rate dependently on just that shader itself to get um, an overall better, cleaner um, look in your reflections. So I've went through and I've done that for my two problem um, materials because um, I don't want to go to 16K <laughs> by any means in terms of firing reflection rays out for those blurry reflections. It's just nicer to have this shader that you can go ahead and adjust that as a threshold. So by default, so by default, the base shader is at one and I've went ahead and come into these custom shaders and put them at 0.1 uh, to get um, 
to just target those areas. And what that point one, if I set it to zero, will actually be firing um, the overall amount of rays that I have at 256 um, s samples per pixel. So when it's at zero, you get 256 samples per pixel. At point one, it's just divisible by that number. So we're not firing as many, um, but you can control all of that by using custom shaders inside of your material groups. And I won't go into too much detail about how I've actually set up um, each material, but I will say um, when it comes to photo real renderings, you need to be able to texture almost every controllable slot of your material or every attribute of your material needs to be controlled by a texture. And you can see, um, for, for instance, the top of the hammer, um, we have a bump map, this asphalt bump, and we have this uh, metal here. The, these textures are controlling um, each specific portion of this material, what makes it unique. And um, especially when you can paint inside of Mari, which we'll have more tutorials coming up about Mari later, um, when you can control all of those by value textures, um, it makes everything so much easier and it creates more of a photorealistic result. But if I went into UVing and texturing in this tutorial, it would take way too long. So we'll save that for next time. So let's go ahead and jump into After Effects and we'll take a look at what our rendered image looks like. So in After Effects, when you bring in 32-bit uh, floating point renders, you have to actually go ahead and set up here in the color settings. We, you need to choose 32-bit and then um, the sRGB profile here and then linearize the color workspace to be able to um, be in the same um, inherent linear space that Moto's in. And if we fl flip over to Moto, um, the only thing that you really have to adjust in terms of linear workflow inside of Moto is your value maps. So um, if you're using it for uh, roughness, uh, bump, anything like that for values, not for color information, you need to set those to linear. But everything else, um, you can see that if you go to the preferences and you go down to the color management, uh, everything is managed here in this open color IO um, that Nuke has, and it works really well with Nuke. It's pretty awesome that you can just go ahead and dump all your stuff into here and Moto will take care of it for you. And you can see that the color swatches and everything is managed as well. So let's flip back over into After Effects and we'll just hide our window there. And um, you can see that I have multiple pre-comps that I work in. So the first pre-comp uh, inside of here, I just have my direct and my indirect. You can see um, how those actually came out. Most of this renders uh, was the reflection and specular values. You can see pretty much everything in this um, scene was uh, reflection values. And then I have my transparent values for the table and my ambient occlusion, uh, which is multiplied. And then I have a depth map, which if I just solo that, you can see I've remapped those color values inside of Moto to create this um, as much contrast as possible in this depth map. Now, um, you may want to play around with this to get the desired result, but um, I've kind of used those depth maps before, and we've kind of created this nice uh, depth of field effect by adding to the adjustment layer um, this depth of field effect, which is from a company called, uh, let's see, Freshlift. Um, so if you uh, if you go ahead and buy this plugin, which you should because it's amazing, um, you can use this FL depth of field and then point it into the depth layer map and you can actually choose the specific parts of the image that you want to have in focus. So if we come out of that one, we have another um, quick pre-comp that has a added vignette, uh, which is just a dark layer. Um, when you double click on the ellipse tool, it will add this uh, mask to it and it's feathered if you hit MM. Um, you can see it's feathered almost 300 pixels and uh, the opacity is brought down to about 75. And then I've separated these render layers out. Um, this, this comp right here has been duplicated three times and the scale has br been brought up just a little bit, a hint, um, in shifting the channels uh, from full red, uh, full green, and blue and using the difference 
blending modes to actually create um, a little bit of chromatic aberration. So you can see when you zoom in, you can really notice um, some color separation here, which, help, which helps goes uh, a long way when you're actually looking at the image as a whole, because sometimes camera lenses, uh, it's a phenomenon that happens with light actually coming into the lens. Um, and then you can see our last um, composition here. Uh, I, I decided not to add grain to it. Um, you can see when I enable this um, this layer here, it looks nice. Uh, it looks believable for like photometric grain uh, um, that you would get from a camera, but I just went ahead and left it off because I spent so much time in Moto trying to get rid of grain and I didn't want to add it here in my compositing package. And uh, I tweaked a little bit of saturation and I've changed my blending modes here, uh, especially for luminosity um, with these curves. Uh, you can just set it to luminosity so that way you're not affecting color values, you're just uh, affecting luminance values. And then um, same thing with the color. Um, I've went through and actually did red, green, and blue and adjusted uh, those um, lines here in the curves menu to get the look, overall kind of look that I wanted here. So that is a quick look at some of my workflows and some of my tips that actually create photoreal renders inside of Moto. And our project-based courses will actually tackle each one of those individual elements so that we can create the best render possible. So definitely check out all of the project-based stuff that we got up right now and stay tuned because we'll have a lot more. And if you guys have any questions, please post them below. Give this video a like because it really helps me out. And um, we'll see you guys in the next tutorial. Thanks a lot.